ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا انه من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا وامامنا وقائدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بلغ رسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك وبعد فإن أفضل الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة في دين الله بدعة وكل بدعة في دين الله ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار my brothers and my sisters in Islam, I begin with the greeting of Islam. May the peace and the blessings and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you and upon you. I continue by testifying that none is worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Acknowledging and proclaiming that the beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the final messenger and a servant of Allah. Whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can lead astray. And whomever is allowed to go astray due to the wrongful actions and sinful desires and inclinations, none can guide back except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and my sisters, Ramadan is coming tomorrow inshallah, starting tonight with Maghrib. We will be praying our first taraweeh here inshallah, given the opportunity to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to honor this beautiful guest who graces us once a year. And it's important for us to remember that a Nabi وسلم, was sitting down one day and he started to say, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And the companions asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what are you saying Ameen to? He said, the angel arrived and made dua. The Ya Allah, whoever lives to this moment to witness this gift, and doesn't take advantage of it or loses out, may they be lost, may be they lost, may they be lost. Meaning the angel made dua against the person who lives to Ramadan and doesn't take full advantage. Because it's like a gift that is given to you on a platter. And the Prophet says, whoever fasts the days of Ramadan with faith and expectation in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's capacity to give, Allah will forgive them everything that was done. And whoever prays the Qiyam at night with Iman and expectation, Allah will forgive them everything that's happened before. And whoever prays behind the Imam until the Imam has completed the prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts for them as if they prayed the entire night. And whoever prays Isha in the Masjid and prays Fajr in the Masjid, Allah gives them the Ajr as if they prayed the entire night. And whoever breaks the fasting of a person, Allah gives them the ajr, as if they fasted the extra fast of that person. And in this month, the doors of Jannah are wide open. And the doors of Jahannam are wide shut. And more people will be given the forgiveness of Allah and the grace of Allah and be admitted into Jannah than in any other month. So imagine, and in addition to all of that, there's one night that is better than a thousand months. Laylatul Qadr. One night, <clears throat> all of the du'as that you make, inshallah, are accepted. And one night in which your entire year's decree is written and descends from above. A better than a thousand months the worship, the fasting, the dua, the qira'ah that we do is equivalent to a thousand times or a thousand months of that worship, if not more. So how can we miss out? And how can we disrespect such a guest? Now the question is, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligate this fasting? And what does it mean for us and what should we be doing in this month? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the ayat about the fast. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا 
كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون or you will believe fasting was made an obligation upon you as it has been made an obligation about or on the people before you so that you may achieve taqwa you may get to a point of taqwa and what is taqwa and Nabi Sallallahu said that taqwa ha huna taqwa is in here it's a state of being it's a state of heart it's a state of mind a state of awareness it's a lifestyle Ali ibn Abi Talib he says at taqwa il khawfu min al jalili wal amal bil tanzil wal qana'at bil qalil wal isti'dad ila yawm al rahil taqwa is to be in awe and respect of the almighty is to not break what he says out of love you know when you love somebody you love your wife you love your family you love your children you hate to do what this what they dislike you fear you dislike to upset them right you don't want to do something that upsets them out of love out of care out of that relationship and that's what it means to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I fear disobeying him I fear disrespecting him I fear crossing the boundaries that he set for me and if anybody is worthy of that love and respect and fear it's not any human being it is the one who made all human beings it's not a limited entity it's the one who's unlimited by anything in terms of space and time so al-khawfu min al-jalili wal-amal bil-tanzil is truly implement what was revealed وَالْقَنَاعَةُ بِالْقَلِيلِ It's to be satisfied with little. I can, I can live with the little. I don't need to have the biggest home and the best car and the best lifestyle. I'm comfortable. Allah has given me enough. And Nabi Sallallahu said that the human being will keep chasing more and more and more and nothing will fill their mouth except the dust. Some of us are so busy chasing this world. More, 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 more. The only time our mouth is satisfied and stops is when we're buried in the ground, in the grave and the mouth can no longer move and the dust has come in to a point where that's it there's no more left, there's no more space left for anything else to go in What an image that shows the greed You have been so deluded by the desire for more, the quest for more to the point where that quest driven you to the graves you competed with one another and killed one another or you were so busy chasing that the only time it stopped is when you were put in those graves it's to prepare for the day that you will depart Muslims don't live just for the moment we care about the moment but we live for the day that is to come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلْتَنْظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Let each and every one of you think about what you have prepared for the day that you will meet Allah. The day that you will stand in front of Him. That's the day that you think about every day of your life. What will I say to Allah on that day? What story will I have to be told on my behalf on that day? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the way, the process of engaging and thinking constantly about that day is the process of taqwa. And at taqwa, as Ibn Hajar says, it is to protect yourself by protecting the boundaries that Allah has set. Taqwa from wuqaya and taj'al baynaka wa bayna ma taqafu min Allahi wuqaya wa ma'asiyati Allahi wuqaya. It is to put between you and Allah's disobedience, a barrier, a protective boundary. So you put boundaries between you and the haram to a point where now you protect yourself. When Allah says, don't do this and don't do that, it may take you years to realize, but then you come to accept that Allah's decree was the best. And Allah's legislation was the best. When you see others enter haram relationships, and then they're consumed and deluded by it. You realize, Sadaqallah. When you see others enter business dealings that are haram, and it takes them years to realize, 
the implications of those decisions and actions, and they see it finally in their health, or in their family, or in their wealth, you sit back and you say, Sadaq Allah. When you see others cheat their way into jobs, cheat their way into positions, and then you see what happens to them in the long term, you say, Sadaq Allah. Allah has spoken the truth and legislated the truth. And even if you don't see it in the dunya, the day you stand in front of Allah, and you see how everybody will be held accountable for every little thing that they've done, you will say, Sadaq Allah. So taqwa is to realize that moment before you see it with your own eyes. It's to live for that moment before you're made to stand on that day. Taqwa is to hold yourself accountable each and every day and to weigh your actions before they're weighed for you and to judge and audit yourself before you're judged in front of Allah and audited. And the ayat in the Quran that talk about the beauty and the importance of taqwa are many and the benefits of taqwa are many. So let us look at them subhanAllah together. If you look at the beginning of the Quran, the first few ayat, Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. And if you look at the last ayah of the Quran to be revealed, وَالتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ The first ayah in our Mus'haf, or two, three ayat, talk about taqwa as a precursor to receiving guidance. And the last ayah of the Quran to be revealed talks about taqwa as necessary to preparing for the day that you stand in front of Allah. And everywhere in between, the verses of taqwa repeat one after the other. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ صَالِحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ هُودٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Salih's message was about taqwa. Hood's message was about taqwa. Every prophet and messenger, their message could be condensed and summarized in taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those of us who fear for our kids. You know, think about many of us. We fear for our kids. We want a better future for them. We want them to be successful. We worry, are they going to make it? Are they not going to make it? Allah says, وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ فَلْيَتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَلْيَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا You worry about your kids? You worry about their well-being? Allah says, do two things and Allah will take care of them. Have taqwa in your wealth in how you earn, in how you live, in how you hold yourself accountable, and speak truthfully and honestly, Allah will take care of them. Allah makes the same promise, and He mentions in Surah Al-Kahf, وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارُ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا The story of the the, the, the children, the two children who had the treasure, we know the story. Why did Allah protect that treasure for them? Why did Allah send a prophet and a wise man, Musa and Khidr, to do what was needed in order to save that treasure for them? Imagine the qadr and how it works. Allah says, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their parents were committed to righteousness. So not only does taqwa benefit you as a person, it benefits those who depend on you. Why does it benefit those who depend on you? Because your kids look at you and learn from you. Your kids mimic you. They see that you're consistent in what you say and what you do. They will love you and love Islam and love Allah. But if you see that you're insecure in your relationship, that you're flippity-floppity, that you're inconsistent, that you say one thing and do the other, in the smallest and the biggest of things, then they will learn to develop those insecurities. So it all starts with taqwa. It all starts with consistency. It all starts by genuinely protecting the boundaries 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to protect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in many ayat in the Quran, in Surah Al-Araf and in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentions, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى Allah mentions, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ Allah mentions the best kind of zad, the best kind of support that you can carry with you on a journey. Imagine you're going somewhere, traveling. You know the question? The oldest question. If you were to be stuck on an island for a month, what would you take with you? What were the necessary items that you would take with you to survive? Allah says, and taqwa is the best thing to carry with you wherever you go that will allow you to survive wherever you are. Not the food, not the pickaxe or the lighter. It's the taqwa. It's the attitude, the commitment to Allah. That will carry you wherever you go. And Allah says, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ You want to wear something? You want to hold on to principle and values that will truly give you the best grounding? Give you the best kind of presentation that allows people to long to be with you, to respect you, to incline towards you. وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ You know when you wear something nice, you wear a suit, and it makes people like, wow, that's a $20,000 suit or $2,000 suit. People who know, know, so they incline towards, what's this person's story? And some people, that's what they do. They dress up to attract attention. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Taqwa is the best commodity that allows people to genuinely incline towards you for you. To love you for you. To have a genuine relationship with you for you and for the sake of Allah. Not because they want something from you. Because the akhlaq of taqwa naturally attract. We all desire, think about Imam al-Shafi and what he says. Find me a genuine, truly committed friend who loves and cares and is selfless and is devoted and lives by these principles. I will do whatever it takes to be in their life. We as human beings, we love, we long for that devotion and commitment. And in a world where there's a lot of backstabbing and lies and cheating and breaking promises and false commitments and exaggerations and misinterpretations, it is hard to find a devoted, committed, loyal, principled friend who calls to check because they love you for the sake of Allah and calls to ask not because they want something but because they're genuine in the love for you and in the concern for you. And where does that come from? That comes from here. That's taqwa. That cannot be purchased. That cannot be misportrayed or falsely presented. That cannot be deceived. It is genuine and it's real. And it starts from here. In addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرَى وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَيُنَجِّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا بِمَا فَازَتِهِمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يُكَفِّرْ عَنْهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِ وَيُعْظِمْ لَهُ أَجْرًا And Allah إن تتقوا الله يجعل لكم فرقانا ويكفر عنكم سيئاتكم. What a gift! Imagine the multiple ayat. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, and whoever has taqwa, Allah will find for them a way out of any difficulty, and Allah will give them a way out in the least expected of ways. Allah says, whoever has taqwa, Allah will give them a light through which they're able to walk. Whoever has taqwa, Allah will give them the ability to differentiate between truth and falsehood. You know, sometimes you're stuck, you're doubtful, you're worried, you're confused. Is this really haram? Is this really halal? Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing that? That hesitation and wavering. Allah says, come back to the roots. Hold on to taqwa and I will give you the light through which you're able to guide your journey. I will give you the heart through which you're able to see what others don't see. 
I will give you the ability to be comfortable with good and resist bad. You know, some people, subhanAllah, the minute a small conversation that is bad or disliked happens, they get away. It rubs them the wrong way. The minute backbiting happens, they step out. I'm sorry, I have to take a call. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable here. To get to that stage where you're discomfortable, uncomfortable, with the haram or the sin, mahakat al sadri becomes the sin, that's taqwa. You get to that point where you're uncomfortable with the haram. Not to a point where you're addicted to it, and committed to it, and can't live without it, and long to it, and pay for it, and travel in secret to find it. That's not taqwa. And fasting, the month of Ramadan, is there from beginning to end to cultivate this taqwa. Because I say no to the food and the water for the sake of Allah. I say no to the things that I need to survive for the sake of Allah. I say no to the things that I cannot live without. And Allah gives me the strength then to realize and to be able to say no to the things that I don't need. The lust and the desire. It's the ultimate training in self-control. It's the ultimate training in self-inhibition. It's the ultimate statement of Allah, I know you provide for me. I know the food and the water and know all those things, they're means to surviving. But you are the source of life. I give all those things up and it's an act that is genuine throughout the day. I can go in the corner when nobody's looking and I can drink a cup of water. I can take a small date. Nobody's looking. But why don't I do it? Because I know Allah is always watching. That's taqwa. Nobody's around, but Allah is always around. Nobody notices, but Allah is aware. So whether it's someone to recognize, someone to observe or not, it doesn't matter. Because Allah is there. That's taqwa. If I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to cultivate taqwa in this month, Ya Rabbi Ameen. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fasting, and our prayer, and our ibadah, and our dua, and our zakah, and our charity, and our sadaqah, and our acts of devotion to one another. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's gifted us the opportunity to be here in the masjid, I ask Allah to give that grace to others who don't have that opportunity. This is a time to think about others. The people of Yemen, the people of Somalia, and we have our brothers here, may Allah bless them from Dar al-Hijrah, who are collecting funds to help those in Somalia with the drought. Please support as much as you can. This is a time to remember the people of Syria, the Uyghurs. This is a time to remember, and the places are many. You know, sometimes some of us get upset. Why didn't my region get mentioned? We have love for every Muslim who's struggling. That's part of our mandate. Whether it's in this part of the world or in that part of the world, every one of those struggles is our struggle. Every one of their pain is our pain. So we're here in a safe space, alhamdulillah, able to pray next to each other, alhamdulillah, able to greet each other, alhamdulillah, able to eat together, alhamdulillah. But what about those who don't have the opportunity? And Allah took it from us for a year and a half, if not more, to show us that He can. Allah, Allah allowed us to miss this masjid and to miss this relationship to show us that at any moment He can. So this is not a time to be selfish and to just focus on you and your family. Yes, it's time to increase your ibadah and connection with the Qur'an and Qiyam at night. But this is a time to reflect on every single Muslim in this world who's struggling, who's calling for dua. And think about ways that we can be supportive, not just in a reactive manner, but in a preventative, strategic, longitudinal manner with a clear mandate and a principled approach to giving support, giving izzah and empowerment to our Muslim brothers and sisters everywhere. And this is also what this month of Ramadan was about. Think about the greatest victories of this ummah, Badr. When did it happen? 
Think about so many of those battles be between some of the crusaders and the Muslim communities. When did those happen? Think about some of the greatest, in, you know, greatest resistance acts against the Mughals. When did they happen? They happened in Ramadan. So Ramadan is not just a month of fasting and sleep and you know all those things that happen in Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of resilience and developing that taqwa which allows for you to have principled commitments in order to carry them through achieving all of your tasks. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم السائل المسلمين فاستغفروا النور وفر الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من استطفى اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك اللهم لنا في ما عطيت وقنا وصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت اللهم بلغنا رمضان وتقبل منا الصيام والقيام والعمل الصالح يا من نال اللهم اغننا واغفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وبفضلك عمل سواك اللهم لا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا ما بلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا اللهم آتي نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكها أنت وليهم ولاه يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا يا رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم and before we get up for the salah very quickly my brothers and my sisters this Ramadan will be very special inshallah ta'ala we're going to be doing taraweeh every night at 9.30 starting tonight and then we're going to be doing Qiyam, inshallah, at 1 a.m. every night, inshallah. And in the weekends, Fridays and Saturdays, we're going to be doing Tahajjud at 2.30, inshallah, at night. So the Masjid will be open 24-7 at night. You can come at 9.30 at 1 a.m., spread the word, and at 2.30 on the weekends, inshallah, to pray and to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Qur'an. Jazakumullah khair. And also, please do still maintain as much as you can your mask, especially with people who are, uh, you know, seniors and those who are not, uh, you know, in, in a position uh, that is difficult or compromised, because still there is fears of a sixth wave. And the last thing we want is in the middle of Ramadan to have those numbers go up again and to be affected. So please follow as much as you can. Keep in touch with the information. Keep in touch with the health guidelines and do your best to have those preventative measures in place so we can enjoy Ramadan as long as we can.